Hi guys, welcome to Indie Burn Reviews. Today, for a very first review, we're going to take a crack at Zack Snyder's Justice League. Hey guys, thanks for joining me today. My name is Cliff Roberts and this is Indie Burn Reviews. Today for our very first review, we're going to throw caution to the wind and jump into the deep end by reviewing Zack Snyder's Justice League. Now some of you may find my opinion and review as warranted as an impromptu Icelandic a cappella concert. but I'm doing it anyway. I'm going to warn you now that this review is going to include light spoilers for the film, so if you haven't seen the movie already, uh, stop this review, go watch it, and come on back. Uh, I'll start off by saying that I absolutely love this fully fleshed out iteration of the film. The, the characterization were deep and meaningful. The action scenes were so much more epic. The stakes were actually real. Overall, a much better uh, interpretation of what was presented back in 2017. Now, I'm going to do my best to make sure that I review this film and break it down as best as I can uh, and judge it as a standalone, but I'm going to be upfront and say that it's going to be really difficult to not draw comparisons to that 2017 theatrical release. Right from the start, Snyder establishes where we are in the continuity by picking up where Batman v Superman left off, showing us that the ramifications of Superman's death has farther reaches than what we were previously shown, with the death cries of the last son of Krypton actually awakening a mother box to herald the forces of Apocalypse. While this is percolating in the background, we join Ben Affleck's Batman as he's in the midst of his search to find other superpowered beings to join his alliance to make up for the loss of Superman. Uh, Affleck does a great job here, uh, personifying the more obsessive parts of Bruce Wayne's personality. He shows that he's a man of singular focus, determined to make right what he feels is a largely personal debt. It has to do with him. I made a promise to him on his grave. I spent a lot of time trying to divide us. I need to bring us together and make this right. The interaction between Ben Affleck and Jason Momoa is tense and believable. The gunslinger-like stare-down helps the audience to deduce that Bruce knows exactly who he's looking for. Establishing that Momoa's Arthur Curry is on the one hand an intense loner, it also shows that he's invested in people by helping this fishing village, even if he isn't exactly warm and fuzzy about it. It also plants the seeds for what would eventually lead to the larger story beats of his solo film. This initial interaction isn't the only great introduction to character. Every previously unknown member of this league is given enough time to introduce motivations, defining characteristics, personal struggles in great detail. Uh, so we're not confused about where they fit in this movie. It really helps when your movie is over four hours long. I also appreciate that the quippiness and snark of the theatrical cut is largely absent here. And instead, uh, we work with uh, Snyder's original dialogue and the and the humor and the quippiness is is provided by characters like Jeremy Irons as Alfred, who is just amazing in this movie. And the chemistry he has with Ben Affleck really makes it feel like that there is a long and multi-layered history between the two characters. So the draft stands at naught for two. Maybe a man who broods in a cave for a living isn't cut out to be a recruiter. Hmm? And he plays Alfred as someone who is just absolutely done with Bruce's bullshit, which is just fantastic. A continuing characterization, Ray Fisher especially, brings great depth to the character of Cyborg in a portrayal of a young man who loses everything, save the one man he's most angry at. Uh, the introduction to Victor Stone establishes both his generosity of spirit and disregard for systemic rules that seem to only serve the most affluent. It also shows he was well on his way to being a sort of a hacktivist long before his accident when he's caught changing grades for a fellow classmate who was going to fail their classes because of issues at home. Like Momoa's Aquaman, he acknowledges the need to help people while being outwardly angry at the circumstances that make him an outsider. The focus of his anger, Silas Stone, played by Joe Morton, uh, is struggles with reconnecting with his son in the face of loss and tragedy, uh, faltering along the way as one would when confronted with both horror and personal inadequacies. Uh, his performance is nuanced, is real, and it's impactful to the story. 
Ezra Miller's introduction is a little bit different, uh, as he's not writing some sort of external wrong or on, or on uh, some urgent mission at the moment when we meet him. But we do get some great visual interpretation of his abilities when he saves Kiersey Clemens' and Iris West from a potential horrific car crash. It's more reactive than Aquaman or Cyborg's introduction, but establishes his power set effectively. I really enjoyed how different uh, the view of super speed is here as compared to uh, the, the 2017 theatrical cut or even with stuff that happened in the MCU. In X-Men's Days of Future Past, we see Quicksilver warn Magneto he'll be cradling his head to prevent whiplash, with no other real concerns about the use of super speed on a non-super speed powered individual. In this scene, however, Snyder goes out of his way to show that, one, because Barry moves so fast, his shoes don't get up to speed with the same inertia of his actual body causing them to disintegrate. And two, establishing that Alan has a basic knowledge of the effects of this on other matter as well, he gently and gingerly cradles Iris away from the crashing car so as not to disintegrate the skin off her bones. It's, it's more than he's just fast. Uh, while utilizing the speed and in the speed force, he becomes not unlike Superman, where he has to be very careful and has to treat the world around him as if it's made of glass and paper. It's an absolutely brilliant depiction, and then tapping into the god-tier level of those same abilities in the climax of the film uh, sets up the premise for a solo movie just so perfectly, especially when you consider that in this movie he's actually rewarded for breaking his self-imposed rules, but supposedly in his solo film, we're going to see how breaking those rules may affect him negatively. Fans of the comics know that Barry works in the police department, usually in some sort of CSI capacity. Uh, this Barry isn't there yet, focusing on keeping enough money in his pockets to live and work on his solo mission of proving his father's innocence for the murder of his mother. We do eventually get there with, uh, with one of the final scenes of the main plot is that he triumphantly arrives and shows his father that he's actually got a job in a crime lab. Bottom, bottom tier as it may be, it helps to establish uh, an, an effective origin story for this version of Flash. Gal Gadot, impressive as always, uh, in her portrayal of Wonder Woman. The script does her and the other Amazons justice by uh, not treating them as exceptions uh, of uh, exceptions to women in action movies and comics. Uh, their abilities, their powers, they're, they're just universally badass. Uh, there's never any moment where the movie is just hourly screaming, and she's a woman. There are a couple moments that are uh, obviously meant to uh, be moments of empowerment, but I feel like that they were genuine and they work really well. Well, one more than the other. And I also appreciate that while the previous movies have already established a sort of chemistry between Wonder Woman and Batman, that there was not some sort of ham-fisted attempt at a romance to fill out a subplot for this movie. Much like her solo film with Steve Trevor, the relationship is given time to grow through mutual experience and mutual trust. Uh, and also in this movie specifically, they kind of leave it open so that we can explore that in a later movie. As they endeavor to find a way to come together, the main antagonist, Steppenwolf, is hard at work locating and gathering the apocalypse and mother boxes to form the Unity, a force that will render the Earth into an ash heap and terraform it to be more like his homeworld in anticipation for the arrival of Darkseid, the franchise encompassing threat. As far as disposable baddies go, uh, I think Steppenwolf was given a lot more than just the motivation of evil. Uh, he has a, a somewhat relatable uh, pl plot here where he's been uh, exiled, he's been shamed, and he just really just wants to make it up to his people and just go home. It makes him, it makes him more than just a flat two-dimensional character and definitely a great contrast to his mustache twirling uh, depiction in the theatrical cut. Why does everyone keep telling me that? I think that the only character that didn't get as much development as the other characters was Henry Cavill's Superman. Uh, there were some moments of introspection and some good callbacks to a solo film, uh, but we're not given any real profound effect as to what his death and resurrection actually uh, actually had on him as a character. Uh, of course, I think that was done intentionally because they wanted to explore that in subsequent solo and ensemble films. Since we're repeatedly teased about that and the nightmare vision that Batman and Cyborg have about him actually going rogue and fighting for Darkseid, I, while I would have wanted to see a little bit more of that journey presented here, I think it would be worth it to see it fully fleshed out in a separate movie. In terms of larger story arc, the movie is actually surprisingly well paced at four hours. I didn't find myself bored between action scenes, uh, with dialogue and interactions mostly serving the larger story. Uh, the, the, cut, the cutaways from the main plot to check in with characters like Lois Lane or Martha Kent or even the Amazons didn't really distract from the movie as a whole, uh, and even pay off towards the latter half of the film. 
Not to say that a good half hour of this couldn't have been cut and the focus still maintained, uh, but I wasn't terribly bothered by what was left in and mostly didn't ask too many logical questions during the movie. Mostly. <sighs> yeah, I'm sure you have to actually take your shirt off every time you jump in the water. Why are they singing? Why is she sniffing his sweater? My wife, who has a couple different degrees in the fields of physiology and kinesiology, uh, assures me that it's quite impossible for Jason Momoa to swim with his shirt on. I'm sure she bases that on science. I thoroughly enjoyed the added scenes during and after the movie that add to the world building of this universe. The nightmare scene with the ragtag group of heroes and villains helped to pay off and solidify the vision that Bruce had was not just a paranoid delusion, but uh, an actual warning from a future timeline. Uh, the return of Harry Lennox's General Sandwick, uh, coupled with the reveal that he was Martian Manhunter the whole time, I think is a fantastic addition. And the tease uh, of him returning to join the League in a future movie uh, really just makes me excited, personally. Uh, it's, the, and it's the right amount of world building and it doesn't weigh down the plot too much. There's, there's probably some discussion about whether or not uh, him disguising himself as Martha Kent rob the emotional weight of the conversation that happens between Martha Kent and Lois Lane. Uh, you could make that point, uh, but I think that this was done specifically as part of a secondary reveal that would have been done in a separate movie. Uh, if, you want to, if you want me to expand on that, leave a comment down below and I can do a whole nother video about that. This one's already going to be pretty long as it is. As far as digital effects goes, there was some definite lackluster CGI here. Um, Personally willing to forgive it because I followed the movement and I know uh, what went into it and how little time they had to actually finish the effects. Uh, so so it, it didn't take me out of it too much. And even at my most critical, there were only one or two moments that stood out as egregious to me. But one that really was egregious. Uh, the other side to that is even at my even in my most forgiving, Steppenwolf doesn't actually feel as real as uh, other CGI characters in other movies like Thanos in Avengers Infinity War. Uh, but my brain made peace with it early on in the film, and it didn't take me out of it or disrupt my, uh, and didn't disrupt my suspension of disbelief. There are definitely successful movies out there with worse CGI than what's presented here. Visually, if you enjoy the Zack Snyder style of Man of Steel, 300, Watchmen, Sucker Punch, you'll love this movie. It's all there. The nihilistic monochromatic uh, palettes contrasted by striking colors, the documentary style snap zooms, slow-mo. Lots and lots of slow-mo. It is through and through a Zack Snyder film. Uh, love it or hate it, it's a style that's become distinctly his own. Uh, a lot of moviegoers may point at things like his use of slow motion uh, as overindulgent, but I think in the medium of comic book movies, it works really well in translating comic panels to screen. To date, I can't think of any more faithful adaptations of comic work than 300 or Watchmen, uh, and that's because Snyder famously has his scenes storyboarded based on comic panels. The use the slow-mo in these movies were meant to highlight the panels he drew inspiration from and to make it feel like a comic brought to life. I get that same sense in this movie. The MCU definitely does not approach presenting their characters in this way, and because of that, they've done a great job in grounding their universe. This is the Snyderverse, however. We lean into the grand scale and the absurdity by almost nearly jumping into the pages of the comics themselves. And while this is absolutely a Snyder film, this movie is markedly different from those other Snyder-led films. Uh, while containing the grim and gritty and serious tone introduced in Man of Steel and Batman v Superman, uh, there are moments of levity and clever moments of comedy undercutting the seriousness of the situation and, dare I say, hopefulness. I had assumed that all the quippy and signature Joss comic beats that were added to the theatrical cut were done so because they didn't exist in Snyder's version. However, I was pleasantly surprised to find these little subtle bits of comedy sewn in. Aquaman pointing and glaring at Barry for running into him during the Superman fight, and Barry floundering an apology made me smile. Uh, likewise, Barry breathlessly uttering, oh my goodness, when first seeing Wonder Woman was endearing as well as funny. And the conversation with Cyborg later, to which Cyborg responds to Barry's question about whether or not he thinks Wonder Woman would date younger guys. What do you think, man? You think she'd ever go for a younger guy? She's 5,000 years old, Barry. Every guy's a younger guy. Or basically, anytime Jeremy Irons is on screen.
It's just fantastic. Seriously, I'd watch the Batfleck movie just with the promise of Jeremy Irons alone. In all of this, it's certainly not the barrage of pop culture references and one-liners the MCU has become known for, uh, and it shouldn't be. The version put out by Joss Whedon plainly shows that that just doesn't fit in this universe. Cheap gags are not compatible. The new level of levity introduced here fits, and it shows that Snyder is developing and understanding his characters enough to know how they would interact, how they would joke with one another, and how they would rib each other. But more important than being funny, there's a transition from the dire and somber nature of the previous films uh, to an uplifting feeling as we close out the film's main plot. This scene in Batman v Superman, where Bruce wakes in his swanky home to what looks like an overcast and foggy day, some random woman lies opposite from him in the bed, and he desperately swallows the remnants of the previous night's booze. This illustrates a spiraling depression, a descent into hopelessness and madness. The world outside is drab, and the view is obscured, reflecting Bruce's outlook on the world. It's a good indicator of the mental state of Batman. Now, we compare it to a similar closing shot of the main plot of Justice League. It's the same room, but light fills the space, not just light, but color. The world is born anew in the aftermath of the ordeal just taken, the goal realized. Perhaps this was Snyder's intention all along, or perhaps he's applying a new method to his filmmaking. But either way, it brings the journey starting in Man of Steel uh, to a triumphant, uh, not ending, more like a triumphant commencement, you know, much like when you when you graduate high school or college, the, the ceremony is called commencement because it signifies uh, the close of one chapter and the beginning of another. Yes, this movie wraps up a story thread that was introduced in Man of Steel and Batman v Superman, but it also opens up so many more doors to a more complex world uh, and stories that uh, stories that have yet to be told and whether or not they get to be told it fulfills the purpose and it makes me want more. As a standalone film, I definitely give this a solid grade of a B. It's a good story, it's good execution, a few issues of logic, but nothing more serious than believing that a man can fly or be transformed into a half-man, half-machine hybrid, or that a race of warrior women live on a magically concealed island. Uh, the standout promise to me would be perhaps a bit of the dialogue is, seems stilted at times. A uh, delivery of some empowering lines worked better than others. Uh, and while I said I didn't feel an issue of pacing, uh, there were definitely moments that could be trimmed, cut, or utilized differently. Uh, I keep coming back to the singing Icelandic women. Uh, it's so it's so random. Uh, and it just goes on and goes on and on and on. Uh, it probably could have been better served to do a transition in the midst of it and just fade out that audio as we transition to the next scene or just cut it all together because I didn't see how it actually helped to further the plot. The writing throughout the story progresses naturally. I didn't feel like I had to question the plot a whole lot. Uh, and any of the questions that I did have were just for just weird decisions. Uh, slow motion, you know, that's kind of a... It's kind of a personal preference. Uh, I don't mind it too much. I could see how people would say it's way too much, but I think it's done purposefully. And while I probably would have used a lot less in a film that I would make, uh, here I, I think it works rather well. Uh, compared to the theatrical release, there's not a metric high enough to how, how I can praise this movie. It's a direct hit against uh, wavering studio support and damaging interference. Uh, it shines a light on how bad movies uh, may not necessarily be the fault of filmmakers, but rather uh, executives who think they know movies than people who have the uh, creative vision to actually uh, to actually create them. Uh, the flip side to that is when we leave filmmakers to their own devices uh, without restrictions, we get four hour long movies. A symbiotic relationship should exist for the sake of commercial art like mainstream cinema. So I'm not saying burn down the structure of and hierarchy of the film studio except maybe we should if they're played with douche monkeys who have, let's say, uh, sketchy behavior and motivations. I am fully 100% on board with the hashtag Restore the Snyderverse movement that's currently going on in an attempt to continue uh, Zack Snyder's vision of this DCEU. Uh, and that includes an, a whole nother movement, uh, hashtag Release the Air Cut. David Ayer, the director of Suicide Squad, has been on record saying that the movie that was released theatrically uh, is not the vision that he originally had for his movie. Sounds familiar. So if if uh, if fans get their way and David Ayer does actually release his cut of Suicide Squad, that'd be a movie I would love to compare and contrast to the to the original theatrical release as well. So here's hoping that I can do the review for that movie sooner than later.
Thanks guys for sitting through that. It was my very first review. So please uh, leave a comment down below. Let me know how I did. Uh, let me know if you agree. Let me know if I was way off the mark. I'd be more than happy to join you down in the comments and uh, have a back and forth going on. Subscribe, check the bell if you want, and hopefully I'll be back sooner than later with another Indie Burn review. Until then guys, take care and keep watching movies.